Karen Reed and her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, were bar hopping on a snowy night in Massachusetts. At the end of the night, they were invited to a house party at the home of a fellow officer in Canton, Massachusetts. When Karen and John arrived, Karen did not exit the car. John did. From that point forward, there are two very different versions of what happened. Prosecutors say Karen was mad at John and purposely struck him with her car and left him on the ground to die in the snow. But Karen and her defense team say John went to the party. Something terrible happened inside the house and his body was placed outside where he was found dead the next morning. Karen has been charged with murder, but claims she is the victim of a big cover-up by police. Prosecutors insist Karen Reed is a murderer, while she insists it was someone inside the house that night who was responsible for what happened to her boyfriend, John O'Keefe. And now, another twist. A federal investigation into the way police handled this case. Tonight. We look at that federal investigation of the investigators and how it will impact this upcoming murder trial. And we'll look at the crucial piece of evidence that Karen Reed's supporters say proves her innocence as we investigate the death of Boston police officer John O'Keefe. I'm Vinnie Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. This story, unlike any we have covered in many, many years. I want to start tonight, though, talking about a case that we didn't cover here on Court TV because it happened back in the 1920s. The case of Sacco and Vanzetti, two guys who claimed that we were framed for murder. These two guys were accused of an armed robbery turned into a murder. They were tried in the courtroom. They were literally put in cages as the evidence was presented. But from the beginning, they claimed they were innocent and they were being framed for what happened. You see, they were very unpopular because of their political beliefs. And in the end, they were convicted. They were executed. But 50 years after that execution, the governor of Massachusetts made a proclamation saying, these two were tried unfairly. They didn't get a fair shake inside of the courtroom where they were tried and proclaimed them innocent men, Sacco and Vanzetti, an extremely famous and notorious case that divided the public. That trial was in Dedham, Massachusetts. Now in the same courthouse, in the same courtroom, Karen Reed is saying, I was framed. And this case, too, dividing the community in Massachusetts. And now that this thing has struck with people across the country through podcasts, through this program, through um, what has happened inside and outside of that courtroom and the bloggers and everyone else involved in this um, has divided the community around the country as to what really happened in this case. Now. When a criminal defendant claims that I was framed, you know me, I'm a former prosecutor, that's the filter that I analyze everything through. I take it with a huge grain of salt. But this case is a little different. There's something else going on here, literally going on. The FBI and the Department of Justice is investigating the investigators. While this case is still pending, there's an investigation on how this case was handled by police. And you know, the entire case for the defense is that the, the police didn't handle this case. Police took evidence, moved it around, and framed, and then covered up what really happened. Framed Karen Reed and then covered up the truth in all of this. That's what they're alleging. So. In this case, there, there will be a search for the truth inside that courthouse in Dedham, Massachusetts, where Sacco and Vanzetti were tried, and now where Karen Reed will be tried. But it will be a search for the truth not only of what happened to Boston officer John O'Keefe, but also a search for the truth of how this case was handled by the investigators. 
And today, another big hearing, and we heard something that, um, I think for the first time, like we, we heard little bits and pieces about this federal investigation, but I want you to take a listen to David Yannetti, who is, um, you'll hear his voice, he wasn't in the courtroom, but was appearing via Zoom in this hearing in the Karen Reed case, and gave the world, and the judge and the rest of the world, an update on that federal investigation of the investigators. Take a listen. On that score, something very important has come to light just yesterday that directly bears on this issue. The Norfolk DA's office and the Karen Reed defense team participated in a conference call yesterday with a representative from the U.S. Attorney's Office. The U.S. Attorney confirmed during that conference call, confirmed for both parties, that not only has there been a federal investigation of this case, but it is ongoing. It's not over. It continues. The DA had this confirmed for them just yesterday, right from the horse's mouth. The investigation is taking place now. As Karen Reed is getting ready for trial on these murder charges, the feds are taking a look at the people who investigated the case and gathered the evidence that will be used against Karen Reed. This doesn't happen, folks. This is extremely unusual. Let's bring in Court TV crime and justice correspondent Matt Johnson, who is outside the Norfolk County Superior Courthouse in Dedham, Massachusetts, not covering Sacco and Vanzetti, but covering the Karen Reed case tonight. And this, when I heard this, uh, uh, Matt, I was like, this investigation is ongoing. Uh, how did this play inside the courtroom today relative to some of the things that they were arguing about? Vinny, good evening to you. You could hear a pin drop in that Dedham, Massachusetts courtroom behind me. I mean, this is something that you've heard rumblings of, but when Yannetti actually said that there is an investigation that was confirmed yesterday during a phone call with the DA's office and also the U.S. Attorney's office, well, um, it was just a complete bombshell in that room when um, he said also that it's ongoing. And at this point in time uh, of the hearing, we were talking about the letters, the letters um, that the defense once released, communication between the DA's office, um, the U.S. Attorney's office, and the DOJ. Here's a little bit more about that. Immediately after our last court appearance, as I promised when I last addressed this court, we filed a motion for sanctions against District Attorney Morrissey, including a request that his office be disqualified from continuing to prosecute this case. I expect that motion will be heard on our next court date. And I ask this court to consider what that hearing will look like. That hearing will prominently feature the contents of all of the eight letters that are at issue here today. The specific content of those letters is one of the grounds that gave rise to our motion for sanctions in the first place. In fact, our motion for sanctions liberally quotes from those letters. And I assume that that is the reason that our motion for sanctions is currently impounded by this court as well. But it is clear from those letters that District Attorney Morrissey is well aware that he's the target of a federal investigation as a result of his conduct in this case. Those letters prove that he knew, he knew that, even before the U.S. attorney ever confirmed that there even was an investigation. <clears throat> And those, uh, those motions for sanctions and for the removal of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, that's going to be discussed at a later date. We'll talk about that. But after these statements were made in court, Court TV got a statement from the DA's office saying that, wait a second here, we're not under investigation. Let's put it on your screen. They said this, quote, no part of the communication with the office of the United States Attorney yesterday or at any point has indicated that the Norfolk County District Attorney or any member of this office is the target of a federal investigation. Mr. Yannetti misrepresented that completely. Uh, the defense told at the court that uh, the feds plan to release part of their investigation into this case, maybe with some discovery within the next couple weeks. That's unbelievable that 
The feds are investigating the investigators, not the DA himself, according to the DA, but the police officers that, and the, I guess the detectives that investigated the death of John O'Keefe. And now the results of their investigation will be released to the DA and released to the defense. So if they come up with something, if the U.S. Attorney's Office digs some stuff up, now the, the defense, Karen Reed's defense, will be able to use that in their case. This is unreal, man. This is unreal what's taking place up there in Dedham. It's unreal, and we still don't know the exact nature of the letters. They haven't been released. The judge actually had to get the letters from prosecutors, the Commonwealth, and read them. Um, she said, I'm, I'm not going to admit a couple of these into evidence, but I will take the other ones and uh, make a ruling at a later time as to whether wow. or not she's going to release them. Wow, wow, wow. Okay, now let's talk about Boston Magazine. There was an attorney representing Boston Magazine who apparently did an article about this case. Uh, what was talked about today in court? Right, so that was another big part of today. And actually, Karen Reed's defense didn't even weigh in. This was basically an argument between Boston Magazine, their media representative, and then also uh, the Commonwealth. They want all access to Gretchen Voss's interview with Karen Reed that she did for Boston Magazine last year. She interviewed her several times, one off the record and then on the record twice. And it was for an article called The Karen Reed Case in Canton, The Killing That Tore a Town Apart. Uh, the state has made a case that they want all of the reporter notebooks, any, any recording, anything connected to Karen Reed, because they say in the state of Massachusetts, the Commonwealth, there, there is no um, reporter privilege here. However, the media attorney that spoke on behalf of Voss was saying, yes, there is privilege here. And also, she has been harassed ever since that story was published. Take a listen. There are really three documents at issue, uh, two recorded interviews, one four hours long, another one two hours long, that are largely, almost entirely, on the record were interviews with Ms. Reed in the presence of her counsel. Okay, you say um, almost entirely on the record. Could you explain that, few, please? I'm sorry. There are a few interjections by okay. counsel, um, and there are also a few areas where counsel asked or Ms. Reed asked that certain information be kept off the record. Okay. So if those were to be produced, we would ask for the opportunity to redact those. Okay, I, un I understand that. What's the third or the second category, the third records? The third is a interview uh, with Karen Reed alone at her home uh, between Gretchen Voss and Karen Reed uh, that was not recorded, for which there are written, handwritten notes. And that interview was entirely off the record, um, subject to the parties agreeing to put anything on the record afterwards if they wanted to, but they did not. And um, no statements of Ms. Reed from that interview appear in the uh, in the article okay there there's also a fourth category your honor that just uh, I became aware of last night which is that there are a limited number of voicemails and texts between the reporter and Ms. Reed that were also considered to be off the record unless otherwise agreed. First, that the Commonwealth's request is unreasonable under Rule 17A2 okay. because it really is just a fishing expedition. The second is that the documents in question are privileged under the common law privilege that permits a reporter under certain circumstances not to turn over unpublished notes and outtakes, and that's especially so if they're confidential. Uh, we are not, to be clear, uh, opposing disclosure of those two interview audio tapes okay. where counsel was present, subject just to the redactions that I previously mentioned. Uh, and the third point I want to make is that this case really differs from many others dealing with the reporter's privilege due to the degree of harassment that this reporter has already experienced due to her objective coverage of this case. The source itself is not confidential. So we're not talking about a confidential source, we're talking about potentially uh, confidential information. But the notably, <clears throat> 
what's cited to our federal cases because there is no reporter privilege in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. It doesn't exist. Um, what I would submit based on the Commonwealth's motion uh, and submissions is that uh, th there is not even a hint or a scintilla of a hint of bad faith or harassment by the Commonwealth, nor is this a fishing expedition. Um, to, to cull through a vast array of irrelevant information. What we're looking for is statements of the defendant. Not asking for statements of the defendant's attorneys or anyone else. Not asking for the reporter's impressions or thoughts or any other things that may be contained within her notes. The statements by the defendant to this person are relevant, they're admissible, and the Commonwealth's request is specifically tailored uh, to just those statements. So then the media attorney goes back up to the podium and he says there is precedent, there is case law in the state of Massachusetts. So the judge has asked him to provide that within the next two weeks and then she's going to make a decision on all this. In the meantime, all of the media, we are over in a section, a uh, roped off section of this particular courtroom and I'm seated next to Ms. Voss and I can look over at her and, uh, you know, she had no comment, but um, she was... Uh, leaning in and taking deep breaths when they were talking about the harassment to her and her family. She has kids. Well, this case, I mean, every time we do this case, whether, you know, through social media, you're going to get messages from either side, both sides, however the whole thing plays out. Um, so I can understand and I can see that absolutely happening here. So let's talk about the scene at the courthouse today. Um, it's cold up there. Karen Reed was appearing via Zoom, as was her attorney. So what was it like? Right. So uh, first, we have to kind of compare it almost to the last time that we were here about a week and a half ago from the last hearing. And there was more than 100 people that were in front of the courthouse over here on the steps behind me holding all those signs. Uh, here's what it looked like today. There was about a dozen or so people here, uh, supporters. And I was asking each and every one. I, I went up to them and I was like, you know, you knew that Karen Reed wasn't going to be here. She was appearing via Zoom. One of her attorneys is out in California uh, covering the trial of his own out there and um, yet you still decided to stand out here in something like 14 degree temperature and hold your sign why was that important and here's what they said it's important for us to show up just, just to show our support and even though Karen's not going to be in the courthouse today this group of people is committed to finding innocence for Karen Reed we all know that that she did not commit a crime and the tyranny that's going on in Norfolk County, along with the district attorney's office, the Canton Police, the Massachusetts State Police, is uh, it's an injustice, and we are not going to give up until until Karen is free and we, we find the people who killed John O'Keefe. So inside the courtroom, Vinny, a lot of supporters filled the gallery. Um, they waited in line for more than an hour to wait for the courthouse doors to open. Um, in the very front, uh, seated pretty close to me, was two rows for John O'Keefe's family and friends. Um, they didn't have anything to say after the hearing today, um, but of course we extend um, our invitation for them to talk about John, which is what the protesters and other people say that this case is about, right? Uh, justice for John. You know, it's amazing. You've got more people showing up from the public at pretrial hearings here in Dedham, Massachusetts, than were showing up for the first week of Johnny Depp's trial in Virginia. It, it's unreal. It, it's unreal. At this stage of everything happening, uh, the amount of people who are focused on this case and interested in the outcome. All right, so what's next now, Matt? Okay, so we have another couple pre-trial hearings. The next one is slated for February 15th. And at that time, um, we know that they are going to be uh, uh, talking about maybe following up with some of the motions that they discussed today, maybe the media order. And then also a motion to dismiss the case. That's pretty standard. And they will also be discussing a motion to disqualify and sanction the district attorney. So we could hear more about uh, that federal investigation according to the defense and what was said yesterday. Big decisions, big case. We are rolling towards that trial. Matt Johnson in Denham tonight. Um, make sure you warm up. Appreciate it tonight, Matt. Thanks so much. All right, folks, uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to bring in our experts and get some analysis of what's happening in this case. Plus, coming up next hour.
In Delphi, Indiana, the Delphi murder case heads to the Indiana Supreme Court as the accused killer's former lawyers fight to get back on the case. We have a live report from the state capitol. The prosecutor has requested that the attorney be disqualified from representing me to, in this case. I do not want this to happen. I want Mr. Baldwin and Mr. Rosie to continue to represent me until this case is resolved one way or the other. Did a contentious divorce lead to a killing? Jennifer Dulos vanished in 2019 and has never been found. Her estranged husband was charged with her murder, but died by suicide before going to trial. Now his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. I think this is going to be a really fascinating case. They've thrown everything up against this defendant. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, only on Court TV. The Commonwealth is moving for a protective order for these letters after revealing part of what they contain. The Commonwealth wants to keep the remainder of the letters hidden because the letters contain information that will embarrass District Attorney Morrissey and his office. The letters demonstrate that he's a target of a federal investigation for what his office has done to Karen Reed. That's Karen Reed with her attorney appearing via Zoom today. In her case, she's been accused of murdering her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, a Boston police officer. She says, no, 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 wasn't me. I didn't do it. I didn't run him over with my car. Something happened at the party I was dropping him off at, the late night after hours party involving some police officers. And something happened there. They're the ones that did it. Wasn't me. Now. What's happening is, is that there apparently is an ongoing investigation by the feds of this investigation. And there's some letters that were written back and forth between the, um, the, the um, state, no, the federal uh, U.S. attorney and the DA who is prosecuting this case. Take a look, uh, 25, Boston 25 News, this is from last December. 25 investigates has learned that the Norfolk County District Attorney Michael Morrissey sent a letter to the Department of Justice requesting that the federal probe of the Karen Reed case be transferred out of Massachusetts. Morrissey's letter provides the first official confirmation that the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Massachusetts is looking into the arrest and prosecution of Karen Reed. And today we learn that that investigation is, in fact, ongoing. Joining me tonight from Jacksonville, Florida, retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Koffendoffer. And in New York City, attorney and host of Attorney Melanie Little podcast, Melanie Little. And joining us in Boston, Massachusetts, um, via phone, criminal defense attorney and author of the books, Super Predators and uh, law and the tough on crime myth. Peter Ellikin is with us. Okay. Jennifer Koffendoffer, let me ask you, former FBI special agent, there's a federal investigation. That means the FBI is investigating the investigators here. We learned today it's ongoing. Your thoughts about that? What is the, the nature of this? And are you surprised that the investigation is ongoing? So this investigation, again, was started some time ago under Rachel Rollins, the prior U.S. attorney. That's very important, I think, as she had to leave her office under allegations of her own. So that is when this file was opened. Whenever there's a public corruption matter opened, and in this case, uh, it was Mr. Morrissey's office. Now, Mr. Morrissey is in charge of overseeing uh, these sorts of investigations. His investigative body is the state police. So, of course, whatever he has had his uh, hands in, in terms of investigations, including this investigation, which was riddled with allegations of impropriety, the FBI is going to step in and do a full and thorough investigation. So we have an investigation within an investigation here, uh, Melanie, and what we learned also today in court, apparently, is that the feds will reveal their findings to both sides. It's sort of an ongoing thing. Um, I've never seen or heard of this before. Your thoughts? 
You know, I've been doing this for 30 years, Vinny, and I've never seen this happen either. This is very, very rare. It, it rarely happens. I, I mean, I, what Yannetti said in court today is that they had a conference call with both sides yesterday with the U.S. Attorney's Office, and the U.S. Attorney's Office is going through an, the almost unheard of process to turn over pieces of their investigation that relate to this case, to both sides of Karen Reed's case, because in his words, he said that in good conscience, they could not allow them to try the Karen Reed case. What Peter, does that indicate to you? Yeah, Peter Ellican, what's going on here? You're in Boston. Um, is this local politics or is this something else? Uh, no, this is, I mean, people make complaints about, you know, police and prosecutors all the time. But the fact that the U.S. Attorney's Office has been doing a serious investigation of this and actually bringing in a grand jury, uh, they, they're obviously onto something here. And the, the idea that um, we've heard the accusation, well, this got started with Rachel Rollins, uh, the former U.S. Attorney. There's no evidence of that. There's no proof of that. However, it's now been under um, the you know auspices of the new U.S. Attorney, um, Josh Levy, and there's been no allegations of him being corrupt or anything, and he's been conducting this for months. So this seems like a real bona fide investigation, and this is extremely rare. They would not be doing this unless they really had some um, a, a great deal of evidence to start out with, and then you start calling in grand juries. Okay, so now how does this affect or what does this mean about what happened to John O'Keefe? Jennifer. Well, if, if, and that's a big if, they have investigative findings that show some sort of corruption, it could affect that. But the bottom line is, I look at facts and have read the entirety of the court filings. And I can tell you the facts are strong that indeed Karen Reed dropped off Officer O'Keefe and ran him over and that is just what the evidence shows. And so if the corruption uh, existed, I would like to know what specifically that had to do with those sets of facts. What do you think, Melly? What does this investigation of the investigators, and, and what does it mean about the, the, the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe? Well, I think that nobody really knows the truth, right, unless we were there. And I've read the entire court file, too. And there are, as always, three sides, at least, to every story. But what we're seeing here is witnesses who testified in front of Karen Reed's grand jury being called now. They're being served subpoenas to come and testify in front of the federal grand jury. So, so much of what um, Jennifer is saying is based on wit eyewitness testimony, right? And if those same witnesses are being called to testify in front of a federal grand jury, uh, you know, maybe some, they are going to uncover that perhaps some of these people misspoke. Perhaps their statements were not accurately recorded. Um, what I've noticed is that none of the witness statements are signed. So uh, I think we're going to see. Uh, we're going to see if, if it was accurate or not accurate what these witnesses told the investigating Trooper Proctor right from the jump. Peter Ellican, I'm always caught in this thing of I understand the job of the criminal defense attorney. You raise reasonable doubt, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, this is very problematic for, for trying a case and proving it beyond a reasonable doubt. But my main concern is the truth of, of what happened to John O'Keefe. So explain to me from your perspective what you think this investigation will uncover. Um, and, and will it uncover the truth about what happened to John O'Keefe or will it just uncover that things, they weren't dotting I's and crossing T's here. Uh, yeah, I, and I know the last time I was on your show, we said the same thing, that, yeah, we don't want to exactly talk about reasonable doubt. There's probably enough reasonable doubt to drive a truck through. But how about the truth? And I think, ultimately, the truth will come out, but perhaps it won't be until trial. Because, And, I, and I'll give you the, the reason for that. Is it because we have so much evidence here with two sides of the story. For example, uh, they... Uh, the defense says that their, the phone records show that he was actually had left the car, gone into the house, was on different floors of the house. We know that. And yet the uh, prosecution says, no, no, that, that data is all wrong. So I think, and we haven't seen any hard data from it, any proof or whatever, and the discovery has been slow. Ultimately, maybe it's going to be a battle of the experts that that will come out 
which side is correct. We also heard that um, one of the people inside the house at uh, 2.27 a.m., three and a half hours before the body was fine, uh, was Googling how long does it take a person Peter, you have done it again. You have teed up our next segment. We have to take a break right now. But exactly what Peter is talking about, this, this alleged Google search that the supporters of Karen Reed really say, this is it. This is what proves not that she didn't do it, that she is actually innocent and someone else did it. We'll talk about it when we come back. Did a contentious divorce lead to a killing? Jennifer Dulos vanished in 2019 and has never been found. Her estranged husband was charged with her murder, but died by suicide before going to trial. Now his girlfriend, Michelle Traconis, stands trial for her alleged role in the disappearance. I think this is going to be a really fascinating case. They've thrown everything up against this defendant. The Missing Mom Conspiracy Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings, only on Court TV. It feels we're the only ones fighting for the truth of what happened to John O'Keefe. And me and my family and my attorneys and my team have marshaled every resource to get to the truth. Just feels like no one else wants it. Karen, just to be clear, you didn't do it. We know who did it, Steve. We know. And we know who spearheaded this cover-up. You all know. Yes, we do. And no, she didn't do it. No, she didn't do it. Definitely. This is an innocent woman. Definitely. She didn't do it. I tried to save his life. Yeah. I tried to save his life at six in the morning. I was covered in his blood. I was the only one trying to save his life. That's Karen Reed on the courthouse steps. And she says she's the she didn't do it, number one, and she's the only one fighting uh, for John O'Keefe here. Now, prosecutors would differ with that. They say, we're fighting for John O'Keefe, too, by prosecuting you for his murder. But there's one piece of evidence that I think most would agree is the key to this entire case. And really the key, the piece of evidence that the supporters of Karen Reed say, this is it, this is what proves she did not do it, that she is innocent, and it was someone inside that house that killed John O'Keefe. Here's Alan Jackson, the attorney for uh, uh, Karen Reed, on this show explaining that piece of evidence. Why is Jennifer McCabe, one of the parties that was inside the house that night, the sister-in-law of Brian Albert, why was she Google searching? How long does it take for a human body to die in the cold? The Apple Cocoa Core data indicates, or the core time indicates exactly what time that Google search uh, occurred. That time was at 227 and 40 seconds uh, in the morning on, on January 29th. That's three and a half hours before John O'Keefe's body was found. All right, two sides to everything in this, in this story, in this case, in this trial. Take a look at the screen. This is what the Commonwealth of Massachusetts uh, is saying about all of that. The Commonwealth ran Ms. McCabe's phone through a Cellbrite reader that was created on May 4, 2022. The, the defense expert used Cellbrite Physical Analyzer, a newer updated version of the software used to download it. The purportedly incriminating search in question does not appear in the downloaded material using the earlier version of the software and therefore was not in the earlier extraction. The updated version of Cellbrite that was not in existence at the time of the trooper's initial download does show such a search. However, the Google search, how long to die in the cold, did not occur at 2.27 um, and 40 seconds a.m. Okay, let's bring back in our guests, Jennifer Koffendoffer, Melan Melanie Little, and Peter Ellican, who's joining us by phone. Jennifer, do you agree this search is the key? Did it or did it not uh, take place at 2.27 in the morning, three and a half hours before John O'Keefe's body was discovered? No, it didn't take place then. That is when her safari was open. It copied to a wall file. And at that point, the other searches that were made after that all have that timestamp. She made that search after she and the uh, Jen McCabe and Karen Reed and the other occupant arrived and Karen Reed was screaming, oh my gosh, because they just found him. How long does it take someone? Google it, Google it. And then that is when Jen McCabe went in and did that. And that's what the evidence I believe will show. Furthermore, Vinny, just from a common sense standpoint, 
They're alleging that all of these people in this house, an ATF agent, a decorated police officer, a 17-year-old, a dog, and, and several women beat this man to death and threw him on the front lawn. Why would you even Google that? You would have thought he's dead. He's got a, a you know a busted uh, cranium at that point. So it doesn't make any sense. The other scenario makes sense. Melanie Little, your thoughts about this Google search? So many thoughts. Um, well, first of all, the defense obviously has an expert who completely disagrees with those findings and says that that search was absolutely made at 2.27 a.m. Not only was it made at 2.27 a.m., but then that search was actually deleted from Jen McCabe's phone before she turned over her phone to law enforcement four days later. She also made two other searches around 6.24, 6.27 a.m., in which she tried to spell it the same way because the first way the first time that she googled it she spelled how h-o-s so it was really hoss long to die in cold but then she made two more searches after 6 a.m around the time that the body was found uh number two with regard to the people that were in the house first they were alleging that the 17 year old was never in the house and his name was never brought up and he was never interviewed until approximately 18 months after this tragic uh, incident of Officer John O'Keefe. And so now they're saying that he was in the house. So I'm a little bit confused. Was he there? Was he not there? There are so many uh, questions here. And I also think that if we're going to use common sense, here's the other piece of common sense. Would Karen Reed, in her horror of finding her boyfriend dead on the front lawn of Officer Brian Albert, yell to her friend, Google how long it takes for to die of hypothermia? I don't. I think that defies logic. Peter Ellican, your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm kind of going to second what I just heard. That it does seem really odd. You just found a dead body on your lawn, and the thing is, then you rush to go to Google. And I'm out of curiosity. How long did it take? That just defies uh, common sense. Again, I think the experts are going to hash this out. The uh, defense experts clearly say that that was a 2:27. And then why would you? Why would she have deleted that after she? Uh, put it in. Um, so I think that it is, um, uh, oh yeah, ult ultimately it's going to come down to um, uh, it, it, experts, and we may find the ultimate ac actual answer. But right now, I don't think that the prosecution has really given enough hard data on it that uh, would convince anybody at this point. And this would be, as we say, this really could be uh, absolutely damning evidence. Uh, that uh, she would do that. And I don't think this idea that was just brought up about, well, why would all these people in the house have, have done that? I mean, certainly friends, if you, an incident happens among friends, it's not some incredibly sophisticated conspiracy. Everybody just kind of covers up for each other and says, yeah, we're going to deny it happened. <sighs> they there, there are two sides, obviously, to this story. A battle of the experts inside a court, and we see battle of the experts all the time. To me, this doesn't sound like it's an area that it should be a battle, right? Are, are we interpreting the, the, it, the, what, is, what is being downloaded from the phone? We're interpreting that? Or is, I mean, to me, it, it, it does, this is an area that should be a little more black and white. Um, I'm just surprised. I'm surprised that this is going to be a battle uh, of experts. Um, so I, I, I guess we'll see. I, I, I guess we'll see on that. There was one other issue um, about what this data is going to say. Um, was, is there going to be evidence that whoever had the phone is walking around or not walking around? Um, Jennifer, your thoughts on, on, on that area that... Um, it seems that this Apple health data will be very significant here. And, and that may be, I think, more up to interpretation than like a timestamp. Well, the Apple health data is not going to be as reliable as the digital forensics from his phone. And that forensics is going to show that no, there were no steps taken or anything else. It's going to be that it was there and underneath them as was found. Melanie, what are, you, what are your thoughts about the, the Apple health data? I think you've, you're going to have the defense saying that he was, there's evidence that he's taking steps. He's taking 80 steps. The other side, obviously, is going to have a different interpretation. 
I, I would I would submit to you that Apple data is pretty reliable and uh, that they have him climbing the equivalent of th three flights of stairs after he got out of Karen Reed's car. Here's another issue that they're going to have is with these Google searches, you can't use them as a shield and a sword. Brian Walsh is also being tried in the same county in Massachusetts. And a huge part of that case is going to be the Google searches that he made after he allegedly disposed of his wife. So the Commonwealth is going to have a real problem if they think in, in Brian Walsh's case that those Google searches are going to be accurate and the timestamps on those are going to be accurate. But hey, in Karen Reed's case, they're not going to be accurate. Peter Ellican, I'll give you the final word tonight. You're up in Boston. You're in Massachusetts. I started this whole hour talking about Sacco and Vanzetti. Do you think we'll have a similar outcome here? Uh, yeah, I think that um, th there's a reason why the public, and you've mentioned this in other, store, in other nights too, why the public is so uh, um, championing her. And she's getting applause and she's getting, and, and the, the town meeting uh, where they all voted to do an audit of the police department. And the public sentiment is clearly on our side, and that's so unusual. And I think there's a reason for that, that there's just so much reasonable doubt here, and there's so much evidence showing her innocence that um, I think that's the reason why this is an unprecedented situation. We shall see. Where she's got so much back, so much support. We are out of time for tonight. Jennifer Koffendoffer, Melanie Little, Peter Ellican, experts, all of them. Uh, thank you so much.